first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for doing this, Aries. Like, you're the most, one of the most reachable people uh, we can actually talk to out here. So thank you for that, too. It's all love, baby. Man, you talk just like T. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> you, <'cause, laughs> hey, man, my, my man, you was raised in New York, but you were born in Chicago. Uh, <clears throat> technically, yes, I'm from Chicago, but I left when I was an infant. So my whole upbringing came up in New York. Uh, and, you know, home is where you lay your hat. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but it's like Michael Jordan claims North Carolina. Right. He's from Brooklyn. He's from New York. Tupac claims West Coast, or Wait. claimed West Coast, but he was actually from New York. Again, born in Brooklyn. I mean, like, that number one, I didn't know Jordan's from Brooklyn. You just do some uh, stats for me right here to, to proceed with, but the Tupac one is perfect. Now, you coming from New York, I was going to ask you some Chicago questions, but you did that, and I really wanted more of New York questions. I got family in New York. I lived for like a year and a half in Flatbush, but I really don't know New York. What was New York for like Aries when he was like a younger guy, probably around like the teenage years and younger? Well, you know, <clears throat> back then, you know, I'm an 80s baby. You know, I was born in 75. Okay. So, you know, I grew up in New York and New Jersey in the 80s. And, you know, back then, that's when New York was in its purest form. You know, from the 70s up until they made it corporate with all the Disney shit and made it safe for, you know, kids to walk in, in, in Times Square. Right. Back when I was coming up, you know, you went to Times Square, you got the dudes on the corner playing the, on, on the streets, playing the three-card Monty, scamming niggas out their money. Uh, you had the porno houses, which would have the TVs outside the theaters showing clips of the pornos. So New York was real gangster back yeah. then. Now it's real corporate. I mean, like, I'm not going to say gentrification, but I am going to say as far as the error and the aura, you're absolutely correct. I mean, speaking of that era, man, you said the 80s, man. That's like that golden era or whatever as far as growing up. So can I just get a, a, a soundbite from Aries as far as your era during that time, 80s and 90s? Who were some of your favorite uh, artists during that time, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I mean, musically, I was probably too young to really appreciate what I appreciated in my 20s because, you know, that was my time. But, you know, we, of course, we had all the legendary artists from the 80s bleeding into the 90s and the early 2000s. Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Prince. Um, you know, I, as far as cartoons go, you know, I think that was the time when, you know, boys was allowed to be boys. You know, we had our own shit. G.I. Joe, Silverhawk, G.I. Joe, Bionic man. 6. You know, Go Box, Transformers, He Man, oh, Voltron. Man. Whereas now, a lot of these cartoons are metrosexual. They're for boys and girls. And they don't feel like they have an edge where it's like just for boys. So I think I just came up in the in the perfect time. The golden era, man. You talking about G.I. Joe, man. You said the Transformer tours, like you like cause I'm an eighties baby too, but I'm just kinda younger than you. I'm thirty six, but man, you you have me reminiscing. Oh, okay, I could I could picture young Aries. And what was it like for fourteen year old Aries knowing he was gonna do comedy and be great in comedy? Cause you referenced that once upon a time ago, like you just knew it around that age. What made you even know it? Like, give me some feedback from that. Well, I, before comedy, I just I kind of felt like I always knew I wanted to be famous, and I wanted to do something in the uh, something that would you know make me famous. I thought I was going to be a boxer until I found out you know you have to be disciplined and not eat bacon, <laughs> and you have to work out all the time. Uh, and then I thought I was going to be a rapper until I realized I really don't have the talent for that. That's why I respect rap and hip hop so much because again, coming up in that golden era of the '90s where rap was at its best. And it, and, it, and it was focused on individualism and actual writing skills and creativity and lyrics. I knew I just didn't have that in me. Um, so, you know, I started doing, you know, I started doing stand-up at 14 because Eddie Murphy was my guy. Watching him on SNL every Saturday night. And I, he was, and I studied him and read about him and I found out that he started comedy at 14. So I just oh, took wow. all that as inspiration, which made me start at 14. 
Man, I didn't even know that about Eddie. Like, so you kind of like, I'm not going to say you mimic him, but the, the dream and goal patterns is almost similar to Eddie's, right? Absolutely, I mimicked him. I wanted to be him. Okay. That's why when you see my first Dev Jam with Martin Lawrence, I come out in, in, in an all denim outfit because I wasn't going to wear leather. That would have just been too obvious. Right. Um, but I came out in an all denim outfit, but I had leather gloves on like he, like he had on in Raw. Right. So, you know, absolutely I was trying to mimic him. Man, that that's 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 huge for you to be a comedian and you give your peers who's a little bit older than you homage like that. And I've noticed you've always paid homage. And being that you just said Dev Jam, let's pay some homage here. Cause you were let, let me let me know if I'm wrong or right. You're one of the youngest ever to hit that stage, <laughs> that Dev Jam stage at the age of sixteen. I'm the only one to hit that stage at that age. I was sixteen, yeah. Man, that's crazy though. Like how how did that even happen for a young teenager? You know what I mean? To even like, a, a stage where well, you legends. know, the dude, the dude. I I know when you look at the credits, and most people would give credit to uh, Stan Latham and Russell Simmons. Right. You know, they put their name on it, but the guy who was really responsible for the birth of Def Jam was a guy by the name of Bob Sumner, out of Jersey, and he's the one that put that he knew all the guys in Jersey like me, Bill Bellamy. Like a uh, talent scout. Derek Fox, Hamburger Jones, Cool Bubba Ice. Oh, so he really was the one responsible for bringing Def Jam to Stan and Russell. And they put their name on it. Of course, Russell being the the uh, the, 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 the mega, the, the, the big time dude that he was, uh, he could get it done. Right. I mean, yeah, you're, you're naming a lot of legendary names out here. And one name I'm noticing, um, I did my homework. And something I did not know, like during that time when you were that young, there was another comedian who would become a legend, and that was Martin Lawrence. What was that like, the vibe between you two? Just like, you know what I'm saying, with similar backgrounds. What was like you and Martin? Or were they cool? Martin was a cool motherfucker, man. Um, uh, and, and of course, you know, Dev Jam happened before the Martin show. But Martin was a cool dude, man. He was real supportive. He gave all of us love and kind of guided everybody made everybody feel confident. So, you know, you got to tip your hat to ML, man. Right, Martin Lawrence. I'm like, what, what you feel like what's going on with him today as far as you think he gets enough credit in the game or, I mean. I mean, I think he's well-respected, well-loved. Um, you know, he definitely earned his spot and earned his stripes. You know, I know in the black community, the Martin show was gospel, you know, and I'm a big fan of him in the movies. Uh, I think him, him in movies, when he's in the movies, he's fucking hilarious. Right. He took, he he ever noticed anything about you when you were that young? You know, like, kind of like us being fans of Aries, the comedian. Did Martin get away from being a comedian and just fall back just being a fan? Like, did he say anything to you during that time? No, nah, not really. Not really. But <clears throat> at that time, it was what it was. You know, he was the host. You came in, you, you came into New York. You did your rehearsal, you did your test run, you showed the cameras what you was going to wear, and then, you know, later that night, we shoot the show, we do the thing, and that's it. Right. Anybody in Dev Jam ever doubted you? Like, I don't even care if it was the maintenance worker. Anybody ever there, you felt some type of, I'm not going to use the word hate, because it's so cliche, but, like, something you can tell you had to go harder over there, or you knew it. You just, you just knew it. No, not really, because we was all starting from ground zero. Okay. As far as that was concerned, you know, prior to Def Jam, there was no outlet that showcased black comedy or black comedians in that light. You know, white people already had it with A and E at the Improv, right. uh, Comic Strip, certain shows they had outlets. Carson, <clears throat> uh, you know, all the talk shows and shit like that. And Def Jam was, was so explosive because it was the first time you got to understand that there were more than there were more black comedians out there with something to offer than just one black comedian per decade. Prior to Def Jam, niggas came in decades. You had one nigga per decade. You had Red Fox in the 60s, Pryor in the 70s, Eddie Murphy in the 80s, and then by the 90s, Def Jam exploded, and you had kind of like Chris Rock leading the forefront, the forefront, but then you had the explosion of Def Jam, which introduced America to Bernie Mac, Steve Harvey, Eddie Griffin, Bill Bellamy, you know, uh, some more, 
Uh, uh, um, my girl, oh God, what's her name? With the big lips. Um, God, her name escapes me right I now. But I know you uh, a lot, of, everybody just got exposed to America. Finally, the way they did anymore. But you were in a couple of classic. You know what I mean. And I know a lot of people remember those. But Home of Angels. I, I'm curious, and I always wanted to ask that. How did you land that role? The, whether it was big or not to you, how did you land it? The Home of Angels role, 1995. I, I auditioned for it. <clears throat> I got the part, and that was that. It was a movie I did with Sherman Hensley. Uh, of course, it was Rest George Jefferson, Abe Vigoda from the show uh, Barney Miller, and he played Fish, and he was also in the Godfather part. Was it part two? Part two. Godfather one. Um, and you know, it was a small little, you know, low budget movie, but it was my first movie. So, you know, while it didn't go on to do anything, it was still my first flick. So it was your first movie? I did, I did not know that. It's just, I remembered you in it, but I didn't know it was your first movie. So how yeah? How much you hold it to your heart today? Now that we're we're about to be in two thousand twenty one, hopefully we are. Uh, I'm sorry. What's the question? Like that movie? Because I did not know. So you dropping some jewels right now to me, Aries. Like you say, this was your first film. I've seen you on. So I'm gonna ask you those questions later. But you know, sitcoms and, and things of that nature. Being that that was your first film, what did it mean for an upcoming comedian as yourself? 1995. You actually have credit. I'm in a movie here, Home of Angels. Like, what was that feeling like? Just take me over there, right quick. I mean, you know, it was good that I had something under my belt. Um, you know, and it was my first time. You know, I have an experience in, in, in that type of thing. But you know, listen. I got more garbage movies under my belt and movies that didn't do shit than I got movies that counted. But that's part of it. You know, sometimes you got to do a bunch of bullshit before you get to the good shit, you know, uh, and that's just part of the game. Right. I, I mean, I noticed people ask you about Jerry Maguire a lot, so I didn't, I mean, that's one of my classics of all time. In fact, I, I didn't want to go with it today. I kind of wanted to ask something or, you know, differently because people don't really ask you about Home of Angels. And, and I kind of like, as a fan, I wanted to throw it out there. But let's hurry up and ask you this then. Why is it that everybody I ask who watched Jerry Maguire, shout out to Cuban Gooden Jr. and his father, Cuban Gooden Sr. and his brother. But my God, bro, like your legendary character <laughs> as the brother-in-law, like, I mean, it, it stood out the most throughout the whole scene. What? Why? After that role, we didn't see you in more bigger movies, and you didn't get solidified as far as that. Because you took it's a good your question. Time. It's a good question. Um, you know, this is a funny business, man. You know, there's, there's been, you know, one of my favorite comedians, God rest his soul, was Patrice O'Neill. Man, rest in peace. And, and and you know, this is a this is a business that doesn't make sense. You know, there are times you do things, and you feel like based on that piece of work. You should go on to become a star, right. and it sometimes don't happen that way. And then there are times you do things where you don't think it's going to do shit, and that'd be the thing that catapults you into stardom. So this, there's no rhyme or reason or no sense to any of this. All you got to do is keep plugging away so hopefully something happens. Right. The real story is when I originally auditioned for uh, Jerry Maguire, I auditioned for Cuba Squad. <laughs> and the director, Cameron Crowe, really loved what I did. But he later told me, he was like, dude, I can't give you the Cuba part because it's too big. And for a role that big, opposite Tom Cruise, we need a bigger name. Thus, Cuba Gooding Jr. But he liked what I did so much that he offered me the role of the brother, and that's how I ended up doing that. I'm remembering that role, and all we can remember is that you didn't have the most time on the screens, but you had the most memorable over the years. But like we, one thing people don't ask you a lot about that, for me just being a fan, is as far as the Proud family. You, Tommy Davidson, Kyla Pratt, like that role you played the hell out of Magic Johnson with your role, Wizard Kelly. Like how did that even come about for you to even be cast in a Proud family? Um, well, one of the main producers of that show, or the main producer, uh, Ralph Farquhar. Uh, I, had, I had tried to do some things with him in the past creatively uh, that never panned out, but I had developed that relationship. So Ralph was always a fan of mine. He always enjoyed my work. So when Proud Family rolled around, he just called me and was like, look, we got this character. 
that we want you to do to be the voice of and uh are you are you want to get down and i was like dog i'm with it so that's that's how that came about okay well i mean that's like my kids today, Aries. I'm not lying. Like, like when you do Wizard Kelly, like my wife still watches like Mad TV classics or whatever. I used to think it came about because of your renditions of you know Irving doing a lot of your roles or whatever. So it that's 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 that's, that's, that's partly true. Like Ralph was a fan of Mad, okay. and he loved the Mad. He loved the Magic Johnson skits. So that's partly true. Okay. Do you know of um, Kyla Pratt? Or it was just you filmed audio only, or did you guys ever work around each other, you and Kyla Pratt? No, we never. You know, people assume that, that when you when you listen to cartoons, that we all in the booth together. And sometimes it works that way, but most times it doesn't. Everybody has a slot time where they come into the studio and they record their part, and then they just edit it all together. I never met Kyla Pratt. Uh, I know Tommy, of course. I've done shows with Tommy. Um, and, uh, what's my girl's name? Is it Paula Jai Parker? Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, I know Paula. We, we bumped into each other at auditions, but as far as actually recording together, it, it doesn't really work out that way. Okay. T T Tommy Lee Davidson spoke high volumes of your name a lot. We're not going to really get into questions like that, but when you do a cartoon like that, Proud Families, not going to go into royalties and all that. Like, what's that like on your banner of as far as your trophies, your, you know, what you keep? Like, how do you hold that up as far as, you know, part of your resume and your legacy? Where, where you see that as? You know, it's another notch in the belt. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of something like that. You know, proud to work with, you know, other top-notch talent. Um, but, you know, you just try to do as many th good things as you can pile it up you know um, but you know you just try to do as many th good things as you can pile it up you know and keep it moving right you said keep it moving and one thing i do as a journalist aries and i'm trying to level up over here i try not to dwell in the past and typical questions they continue to ask you about certain things of your past and i only wanted to more ask about not precisely the you know the zoe williams situations i don't really pay And I only wanted to more ask about not precisely the, you know, the Zoe Williams situations. I don't really pay attention to things like that. Being a military veteran, um, it's just more of what was the reaction of other comedians around you? I'm somebody like that. I look at people around me who are... Yeah, it, 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 don't, it, don't, it, it don't matter to me. Because other comedians don't pay my bills. Other comedians ain't trying to put my kids in college. Right. Other, other comedians don't pay my kids health insurance. Right. So I can give a fuck what another comedian thinks. Right. No, as far as your peers, like, forget about what they think. Like, did anybody try to hold that against you? Was anybody... You know, I always wondered that just being a fan from afar... In your world, is it kind of like our world in the regular world? Like you got your haters or you got your people, you know, just I mean, you know, people people always got something to say, you know, the words don't mean shit. It's action. Amen. So, you know, again, whatever it is you think, whatever it is you have to say, if it don't if it don't if it ain't about breaking bread or keeping my lights on or paying my mortgage, I can give care about it or not. And like Bruce Bruce situation. I've heard I haven't heard of Bruce Bruce in a while. And the last time was a few years ago. He made some comments. I forgot the name of the radio uh, podcast. It was. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. You seen that? Wow. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know a guy that prior to guy, he was on stage and the guy was tweeting that he's terrible. Oh, what? But he wasn't terrible. But he was, he was crushing it. He was actually it. <laughs> crushing it. Ah, and he fired him. I'm not gonna call his name, Eric Smith. But the thing is, oh, oh, oh man, that's 
do. I find him very funny. But every time, there are other comics will say, God, he was such a dick. He was such uh, a jerk. And, and, yeah, um, he is. And he is. <laughs> but he was on Mad TV for eight years. And yeah. you can say Aries Spears and you'd be like, who? Yeah. And I'll tell you what happens. He comes in here and, he, and he's really nice to me. And yeah. I'm like, I don't see why everyone doesn't like Aries Spears. But every time. Oh, man, he's and, a piece of work. And, and you'll go further. I said, because I did a show with him one time in um, um, uh, Delaware. And uh, I was headlining. And he had a problem with it. And I say, hey, if you want a headline, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem. The money's not going to change. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he gets on stage and he rips it. I mean, he goes in front of me and he rips it. He claimed he had to go catch a mic. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and go up. Yeah. He rips it and drops the mic, you know. Boom! Uh, Walks off stage. Yeah. I come behind him and double rip it. Oh, yeah. oh. And I look off stage and he's standing there. I said, I thought you had a fight. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's why? him being an ass. Yeah, it's, you, it's his you. attitude. Yeah. It's the whole thing. Yeah. Like, people will offer him stuff, but by him so hard to deal with, they don't want to deal with it. People are not going to That's what I always heard. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> so it is competitive. I yeah. mean, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, that. Ego's in this game. I did that purposely. I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, he went extra hard. I did that purposely because he was just being such a prick. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Care about it or not? And like Bruce Bruce situation, I've heard. I haven't heard of Bruce Bruce in a while. And the last time was a few years ago. He made some comments. I forgot the name of the radio uh, podcast. It was. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. You've seen that too. Okay. Go. Do you care to speak about that if you want to or not? Well, I'm gonna just say I reached out to Bruce Bruce. I hit him up in his DMs hang and I said, my God. Hang on, Aries. I don't want to look messy. He, What he did bring about, let me at least say it for the fans who are watching it. Now, what Bruce Bruce said is something interesting that I just kind of wanted Aries to speak about or not. He said something about Aries was at a Carolina show, if I'm not mistaken or not. And I don't want to go deeper into that. I don't do the he say, she say. I'm going to let you clear that up. Well, let's just say this. At the end of the day, um, like I said, I reached out to Bruce Bruce on uh, on uh, his, his Instagram, I DM'd him, and I said, hey, dog, if you got something you want to say about me or you got a bone to pick with me, here's my number. Holler at me. Let's talk about it. But what you shouldn't do is talk shit behind my back, but then when I see you, you act like everything is everything, which he has done. So all I'm saying is if you got a bone to pick with me, holler at me. But don't, don't, don't play two-faced. Just holler at me. I mean, like, honestly, that that's the response I was really looking for. It was not really a long, you know, you explained it even deeper than I wanted to. I could have picked this and that apart, but there's two sides of every story, and I think you did it in a more respectful way than he did. That's why I can believe certain people more, because you didn't throw his name under the dirt or anything like that. That was, that was actually a response that I could see maybe what Bruce Bruce was saying was more of he wanted to get a response from him. From what I'm saying on you did a special look, I'm smiling, which one of your best work I wanted to just say to you in your face, one of your best works out here. What made you do this and what inspired and motivated you to do it? And was it a way to get back at everybody who doubted Aries? That's why I wanted to personally know. No, not really, because I'm not in the revenge business. Um, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to be as honest as I can right. uh, about what matters to me. Um, so it was just, you know, it wasn't about trying to get back at anybody. It's just at that time, what I felt in terms of expression and what it is I wanted to say. And I think the more meaningful thing to pay attention to is not necessarily the content itself, but the cover of the, of, of what the, uh, of what the DVD was, you know, which was me in blackface with a white Hollywood executives behind me looking on for approval, which is just to say, you know, there's this stigmatism in Hollywood that if black men don't smile, we're angry. So, you know, Hollywood likes for niggas to show jazz hands. So my whole thing was being sarcastic and saying, look, I'm smiling. I'm giving you what you want, hence the blackface. I mean, I put it on the screen for the people to see it too when this comes about. I mean, that, I thought that was clever as hell, man. Like, I, I kind of, I'm not going to act like with well, the way you just broke it down, I understood it, but I can get what you were trying to do with that. With the whole 1920 stereotype, and I, I got the gist of it, but do you ever feel it wasn't pushed enough? Like your other. Well, I don't know when to say that name. Say that, say, that, say that again? Do you ever. Cause there's a comedian, I don't know the female's name, Amy Schumer or whatever, and I don't want to ask whether you like her or not because that's not what we're trying to do here, but I've noticed, rest in peace to Patrice and Nils of the world. 
Like when comedians like that, they get pushed by all the masses. But you come out with Hollywood, look, I'm smiling. And as far as the push and notoriety, do you feel it wasn't pushed enough? Being that because it was coming from you, Aerie Spears. No, I mean, look, it was on Showtime. So, you know, I know Showtime might not necessarily be HBO, because uh, HBO is the big bully on the block. Uh, but nonetheless, it's Showtime, which is to say it might be the difference between McDonald's and Burger King. You know, you might like Burger King more than McDonald's, but I think if you polled, uh, if you did a polling contest, McDonald's has always been number one. Uh, and that's no disrespect to Burger King, but McDonald's is number one. Right. With that being said, um, you know, people going to feel how they're going to feel about what you do. If they're going to like it, they're going to like it. If they're going to hate it, they're going to hate it. But at the end of the day, the good thing about getting older is you get to a point where you stop giving a fuck about what people think. This is just me. I like the chemistry that you had with two brothers on Mad TV. I looked at you as big brother because you were the legend on that show. And that that would be Keel, Keelian Peel. Because that interview there with the Vlad TV, I always wanted to know, is that situation deaded? Is everything cool? Or what was that situation about, if you care to speak on that? Uh, you know, listen, uh, much love to, to Jordan and Keegan. They do anything. Um, certainly Jordan is one of the top-notch directors in the game. And I hope that before it's all is said and done, I get to work with him. If I do, that would be excellent. If I don't, well, then that is what it is, too. Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure they hold you a value. Um, I forgot as far as the the year precisely, but if anybody looked at that show, they can see who were as far as the big brothers, whether you thought yourself as one or, or not. As far as backlash, what were some of the things behind the scenes? Did anybody call you on it? Did you receive any backlash as far as amongst your peers in the media? Forget about the fans or whatever. No, not at all. Okay. Was it something that any of them tried to reach out to you, or it's just... No. No, no. Okay. How do you like their show, like, as far as... What do you think of them not doing the show anymore? I've never really went deep into that. i seen it was a hit show, then all of a sudden... Hey, listen, listen, listen. They went on to bigger and better things. Like I said, the, the biggest thing you can do is congratulate them. So I wish them nothing... And I, I'm not going to lie about that. Seeing him do his directorial debut with the first film, Get Out, I guess his, his car is worth played right. Shout out to you for responding to that question, Aries. Okay, as far as there's something going around, and I, I need you to answer this, Aries, because you're a comedian. I have the best expertise to, to help me out with this situation. Everybody know the comedian Doug Williams. And there was a situation, and I'm finally glad it was brought up to light. We all heard about this in the background for years now. And I never really dig deep into it other than that's kind of crazy. But when Doug William explained how one roast led to the demise of his career, and he somewhat for years been blaming Jamie. Do you know anything about what I'm talking about? Yeah, listen, man. This is Hollywood. At the end of the day, money counts. So I don't think anybody's career is under demise. You know, if, at the end of the day, if you can open up a box office weekend, if you can show that you can produce... Receipts in terms of dollars, all is forgiven. I think people get extreme with things sometimes, and they say things just with dramatic effect. Doug Williams is a funny, uh, funny dude. I don't believe anybody has the power to end anybody's career. Right. I think at the end of, end of the day, uh, as long as you can prove your worth and you can, like you know, show some results, all is forgiven. It'll be fine. I'm with you. I didn't like the fact that he says these words about himself. So although in a joking manner, but I can somewhat, I was kind of towards his side. Do you feel as a comedian yourself, are there boundaries and codes? I'm not going to say code of ethics, but just through you comedians, are there codes on when not to really take things too far as far as, you know, without naming names, but like how would Aries would have did that if he was doing the roast that day? What if you give him, a, I, not you doing the roast, but you being on Jamie's position? You broke up. Say it again. How would you have reacted? Like, you would have pretend you're Jamie Foxx without really speaking on Jamie Foxx. You're a comedian, and someone is doing a roast. They throw a jab at you. Would you continue relentlessly to go at them? Or when you would you notice you're doing a little too much? I mean, or, or there's no no holds bar involved in it. I mean, it's a roast. That's what they do. 
So that's part of it. So once you enter the arena where you know where the rules are, you play by the rules and you create your own. But it's a roast. Right. So as far as the as people are looking at it, looking at it as Jamie Foxx was out of bounds, you as a comedian, you don't see anything wrong in that at all that day. No, it's a roast. So why would I think he's out of bounds? Right. You know what I'm saying? If you in a fight, you can't sit up in the middle of a fight and go, <laughs> if you're a boxer and go, man, you throwing too many left hooks. You out of bounds. That's part of the game. Right. Man, you hey, you... Hey, you, you, you take things solid areas. I like that because I, I think as a comedian, you shouldn't show there's nothing wrong being vulnerable. But I guess the way you just explained it, I said, like, you got to take your rounds at the end of the day. I mean, I, I'm more on Doug Williams' side as far as if he knows Jamie. But to feel sorry for a comedian going through that, I guess it will be between the parties involved in it. Because like you said, it's a rose going on. I personally seen the video. I didn't think at the time it was anything wrong in it because I seen Doug laughing. Um, I, I hope them brothers can reach out with each other and things are good because I didn't think people were holding things inside. I, I didn't think it's a rose like people are saying his career's demise or whatever. That will be it because I, I seen a lot of Doug Williams' work. He is a funny dude. And I think it was just a bad night. We all have bad nights and I'm pretty for comedians. And I, I want to carry on. Like you said a few years back, you don't have a lot of comedian friends you know what I'm saying, that you can call friends. Like, I, I've i noticed you quoted that, and let me know if I'm wrong. Why is that? Because I did separate, I separate the word friend from colleague. You know, it's one thing to be a colleague, it's another thing to be a friend. A friend to help you bury a body. A colleague is somebody you work with. So, you know, a lot of these dudes in the comedy game, we can have a conversation, we might talk before a show, after a show, if we're in a setting where there is a show, even if I'm not performing, you're not performing, we can sit back and throw some drinks back. But that's not really friendship. We're two colleagues in the moment. What I consider a friendship is somebody that's been through wars with you, somebody that's broken bread with you, somebody that's cried with you, somebody who's been in trouble with you. So I, I, there's a big difference between those two words. Right. I, I mean, did you notice any examples without saying names or instances as far as to make you know you're 100 percent correct as far as a feeling to know that these guys. I mean, I, I know, of course, not the body part. That makes perfect sense the way you broke it down. But have you seen anything being displayed that make you go, wow, big time? There's no way you could be friends with some of these people. No, it's just I'm 45 years old, so I'm comfortable in my own skin and I know what I'll tolerate. And what I won't tolerate, and I know bullshit. You, you, you referenced just now bullshit from real shit, and you said you're 45 years old. Okay, at that age, the maturation process, the level of talent, you display clearly you're one of the top, if not legends in the game. Do you think comedians today have more of an easier path to go through than what Aerie Spears went through? There's nothing easy about show business. Um, there's just more avenues for possible success. You know, because of social media, uh, everybody now has an outlet to be able to voice their opinion and flex their muscles creatively. But no matter what, at the end of the day, there's nothing easy about this business. The only difference is, are you going to have 15 minutes of fame or 15 years of success? Right. I mean, the, the years of success, because you once quoted that Hollywood is not about talent. It, 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 you know what I mean? Like, like, can you go in depth about that? What did you experience to make you even say Hollywood is not about talent? Only from your perspective. At the end of the day, it's about talent. But sometimes what goes through are the bells and whistles. You know, talent should be the number one thing, but it isn't. Um, at the end of the day, it's what sustains you. But the bells and whistles sometimes is what gets you through the door. That's why I'm saying there's a difference between. 15 minutes of fame and 15 years of success. Set. Right. The, the 15 years of success that you've been through, like Mad TV, what came about with your, I know you answered it a lot, but when you got Mad TV, you know what I mean? I, I don't even want to go deeper into the first time you got into Mad TV, but you were going up against SNL during that time. And if you ask a lot of people growing up, they'll say Mad TV was way more funny than SNL. Do you think that kind of hindered well, I don't feel your career is hindered, but do you think anybody, if they're like kind of more funnier than SNL, especially an up-and-coming game changer like Mad TV was, do you feel like low-key they were blackballing you guys during your young star careers? 
because you guys were more funnier than the bigger comedians during that time? No, one had nothing to do with the other. Matt, you know, Saturday Night Live is its own entity, and they can't be fucked with. So, you know, uh, it's almost like the difference between playing in the NBA and the CBA, or they were better yet, the ABA. Yeah, the ABA had a lot of talented people. One of the most gifted ever was Dr. J. But you'd be fooling yourself to believe that the NBA or the, NBA or the ABA could fuck with the NBA. It was clearly a difference. Let me run it down with the seven. During that, Dave Chappelle recently had comments about Netflix, and he had a situation where he was telling his fans to protest that situation. Do you feel uh, comedians should look out to their fans as far as support when it comes to situations of that? Uh, well, I think the most gangster part about that was that Netflix looked after him. You know, uh, they value Dave. Dave did, what was it, four specials with him? Uh, they paid him over $60 million. You know, they're protecting their investment. That's good business. Right. So you thought it was honorary work the way Netflix immediately jumped to the defense of Dave? Absolutely. Well, how more practice like that should be done am uh, among the industry? <laughs> Fuck the industry. It should be done like that in life. Just let me keep going. The accusations made against... Uh, Paul Mooney, and you can summarize it real quick any way you want to as far as and get better soon, Paul Mooney, but the accusations made against Paul Mooney, you know, again, from coming from Richard Pryor's son and the bodyguard, allegedly, you know what the accusations are. Like, any comments on those accusations? No, not really. I don't, I don't, all, listen, there's three sides to every story. Yours, mine, and the truth. So nobody really knows the third side, but, you know, whatever that truth is, None of us know it, right. so I'm going to leave that alone. Okay. Humbly, as Paul Mooney is not really in the best of help, you personally think we should all wait to hear his side as well too, right? If he's not in the best of help, I don't think he would give his side what it needs, to, what the proper okay. insight that needs to be given. Agreed. Get well, Mooney. Now, um, you refer to Eddie Moore, uh, Murphy a lot in your interviews, and I understood that earlier you, you spoke about, you know, this is some, in a homage way of him. Thank you for giving him his flower, by the way, too. You're one of the, I know a lot of comedians say Eddie, but who really gives him his flowers? There's always competition level. Being that American, uh, um, coming to America, too, is coming. Is that something you're looking forward to? Or I just want to know the fan side of Eric Spears, not just the comedian. Is that something you're looking forward to? Absolutely. I think I, I wish it would have came a lot earlier, right. but uh, you know, when you're dealing with a genius like Eddie Murphy, uh, you know, I know he's gonna shine. I know he, I know the movie is, is is has got a lot of good and great people in it, so uh, I, I think it's gonna do what it's gonna do. In me, right? Um, hey, um, so you know, I started doing stand up at 14 because Eddie Murphy was my guy. Watching him on SNL every Saturday night and I he was and I studied him and read about him and I found out that he started comedy at fourteen. So I just oh, took wow. all that as inspiration, which made me start at fourteen. Man, I didn't even know that about Eddie. Like so you kinda like I'm not gonna say you mimic him, but the the dream and goal patterns is almost similar to Eddie's, right? Absolutely I mimicked him. I wanted to be him. Okay. That's why when you see my first Dev Jam with Martin Lawrence, I come out in 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 an all denim outfit because I wasn't gonna wear leather. That would have just been too obvious. Right. Um, but I came out in an all denim outfit, but I had leather gloves on, like he like he had on in Raw. Right. So you know, absolutely, I was trying to mimic him. Man, that that's 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 huge for you to be a comedian and you give your peers who's a little bit older than you homage like that. Man, hurry up! All right, DJ Vlad TV has been getting criticized lately. And being being that you worked with him in the past before, how do you feel as far as the backlash because of comments he he misunderstood or a miscommunication about Minister Louis Farrakhan? Now you have comedians such as Godfrey, um, former artists such as the brand new being front runner Lord Jamar. They have took a, a a protest where and even Noriega from the Drink Champs. They're they're now protesting Vlad's platform. I just wanted to get an insight. How do you feel about all that? Or should we even be protesting people's as far as the interviewers? Should we get together and start doing things like that? Do you think it's right? I mean, just anything I want to know from your feedback from it. 
you know, I can't speak on other people's motives. Uh, if they feel strongly enough about the subject, if they feel they need to take a pause, I got to, I just got to respect them for their decision. Um, yeah, you, you know, you just have to, you have to be careful about, uh, what you say sometimes and the things you do because it's either going to hinder you or it's going to push you forward. So I respect everybody's stance on it if that's how they feel. Right. Well, would you, well, if somebody said, Eric Spears, we needed you to protest Vlad TV right now, would you protest Vlad TV, if you don't mind me asking? I do things based on my own passion, not everybody else's. So if I feel it's something I need to be involved with based on my passion and conviction, then that's the decision I make. If not, then I go in a different direction. Right. But as far as protesting something when we don't like a certain person, sometimes people might look at it as disingenuous or for your own reasons. But basically something like that, do you think that's a good method to do all the time as far as the entertainment business goes? And again, it depends on what you're passionate about. Right. Okay. I mean, as far as would you would you today go back to Vlad TV if he would call you up or you would need to call up for any reasons, even if it's coming from your side, would you still do business with Vlad TV today? It depends on where I'm at in my life and in, in terms of my position. Okay. Coming up in that golden era of the '90s, where rap was at its best, and it and it and it was focused on individualism and actual writing skills and creativity and lyrics. That's I knew I just didn't have that in me. Um, we're, we're about to lose you away. Thank you for your time today. But before you leave, Tiny Lester just recently died. Have you ever ran across Debo in this business? I never met him personally. Okay. Any thoughts about his death or his uh, career or whatever? Anything you want to say towards that, if you would like to? Prayers go out to him and his family. Uh, you know, he was a staple in the entertainment industry, certainly creatively from the, uh, in terms of black culture and black entertainment. And uh, he'll, he'll be missed, man. Right. And, um, okay, what's your five, what's Ari Spears' top five comedians, dead or alive, right now? Dave Chappelle, Patrice O'Neill, um, Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, and Ari Spears. Legendary list. Top five rappers, dead or alive, right now. Jay Z, Nas, B. I. G. Tupac, and Jadakiss. And Jadakiss. Well, I mean, I, I musically, wanna, I, I was probably too young to really appreciate what I appreciated in my twenties, because you know that was my time. But you know, we of course we had all the legendary artists from the eighties bleeding into the 90s and the early 2000s. Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Prince. Okay, okay. Well, I, 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 wanna, I know this is a long time ago. You said it on Hot 97 with Ebro. That have your opinions changed about 2 Chainz since years ago you called them the, like one of the most rack, uh, wackest rappers oh, Rock him, KRS-One. Where is the art of lyricism? Spit a hotline to me by 2 Chainz. I, I like two chains whole verse on Spit a hotline. Spit a uh, hotline. What's my, my line? Took um, the color of camping. I'm drunk and high at the same time. On a, getting uh, what, what on nah. the airplane? It's hot. This whole verse merch. My is man hot. said. My man said I'm different. I show up to the club with my cellar missing. Now if the club is popping, you the only nigga there with a convertible. Nigga, you in a drop top. That ain't different. Show up in a horse and buggy. What do you say? What do you say? <laughs> oh, I'm trying oh, to be dude, a lyricist. Man, mom, that's not man. what he's trying to do. I, 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 and I guess that's what my thing is. Like, yo, the beat is. Dope, it make you bob your head. I like that. But lyric, how do you forget now, the but, art of but lyrics? Let me, but let me very simple. So, so let me ask you something. Whether it's Rick Ross, Two Chain, I'll even throw in Lil Wayne. You telling me when you talk about Nas, Jay Z, Biggie, Jada Kiss, I'll even whether it's KRS One or Rakim, you telling me any of them rappers are better than them five I just named? No, no. you just named that's some of the different. greatest of all time. Yeah, that's no. a different convo. It, no, well, what, what do you mean? Average, you can't, can't even compare them. The, have Honestly, your opinions changed about Two Chainz since years ago? You called them the like one of the most rack, uh, wackest rappers out here. Much love to Two Chainz, man. He's doing his thing. Okay, so your opinions kind of. I, I thank you for that, but have your opinions changed a little bit on him? As far as the way you used to think about him when he first popped in the scenes to now, you know, a different side of two chains or whatever. 
Much love to Two Chains. I'm glad he's doing his thing. Okay, so Aries, one more, one more question, and let's get it out the way. As far as a smoker, this is just for me because I'm a smoker. You did a, a magazine cover recently with the Chronicle, and that was all the way like around April. What's Aries' stance on smoking? On smoking? Marijuana, that is. Light up any any chance you get. Light the fuck up. You have any endeavors or any business plans joining into any type of field in this new industry booming? Uh, you know what? Not not off the bat, but if I do, uh, I got some dudes who could help direct me and guide me into the right directions. Big shout out to my man Be Real from Cypress Hill. Uh, he's one of the top notch niggas in the cannabis game. Word. So if I if I decide to go there, I know who to go to. Okay, like um, so so as far as smoking, do you also partake in the marijuana medicinal part or whatever? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you, man, Aries, man. Honestly, I I, I I wrote a lot of um questions purposely just so it don't be boring or whatever. So you didn't bother me at all by leaving. You gave us over forty three minutes, man. And I'll tell you, honestly, you're one of the, one of the most smoothest people to work with. And I, I challenge anybody else who want to work with this comedian guy by the great name of Aries Spears, man. Listen, like he didn't have to do this. He gave smoke game. Um, one of the best interviews we're at, we're gonna have to close out the year, and I would like to tell you thank you, man. I appreciate it. This is one of my bucket lists. Now I have kids myself, and I can say, reach for your dreams because they do come true. Thank you, Mr. Spears. So I'm good, baby. And make sure y'all DM me on my Instagram for the link to the Spears and Steinberg podcast available on all streaming platforms. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, and I'll have the links in the description box, and all, and I and I know how to do my own research. I'll have all your situations, and I'll hit you up so you can send in. I won't be a bugaboo. <laughs> Shout out to Aries Spears, man. You have a blessed day, and you take care, brother. All love, baby. Much continued success to you. Thank you, Mr. Spears. Thank you. All right, boy. All right. Thank you. Well, Smoke Gang, we just closed out another interview, man. This was a great interview today. Uh, like, like I tell all of y'all, man, love your family, love your kids, and stay blessed, man. We did another one. If there's anybody out there you want us to reach out to, you want us to speak to, man, reach the Smoke Gang, right? Uh, whoever you have in mind, we'll reach out to them, and we'll, we'll get the exclusives like we keep getting for y'all, man. This has been a crazy year. Knock on wood, if we make it to 2021, we'll have continuing more exclusives for you guys in the way, man. Salute to the Smoke Gang. Blessings, man. Love your family. Love your kids. And stay blessed, as always, man. I'm telling y'all, <laughs> things are going to get turned up for this platform, man. Blessings, man, to the guys. Hey Smoke Gang, make sure you follow I Smoke Hip Hop platform on all media sites and social media sites that is. Thank you for watching another great interview of I Smoke Hip Hop Live. Please make sure you subscribe for more love and blessings. Love your family, love your kids, and stay blessed, Smoke Gang. Salute.